Uh, thanks for the brief introduction, uh, and thank you everyone for coming. So it was a great, great pleasure for me to be the first speaker of the semester's uh, seminar series, and actually also for the first speaker after returning to in person. I'm very, uh, it was a great honor. So today I'm going to talk about a piece of uh, applied work uh, on goal based investment management. And this is a joint work with uh, Agostino Caponi from uh, the IUR department at the Columbia University. So um, I see lots of student faces. So th this talk is, uh, will be like very accessible to you guys because the, the initial motivation or uh, like the, the primary uh, focus of this work is to apply it to the robot advising industry uh, where like the men, you know, targeting customers are general households with very little or limited finance knowledge. So it's supposed to be simple and, and you know, easy to understand. So here's the outline of the talk. So I'll begin by giving a intro brief introduction and motivation of goal-based investing. And I'll describe our uh, goal-based optimization problems and the main results. And then lastly, I'll present uh, some numerical analysis and some comparative statics, okay? So introduction. So let me start by talking a little bit about the notion of risks beyond portfolio volatility. So most academic research associates risk with the volatility of the investor's portfolio. However, most investors actually, or every day like households, they actually associate risk with the probability of not attaining their goals. Like for us, every people have multiple goals like at different times in their life. They have retirement goals, they have goals of financing, purchasing a house or buying a car, financing a vacation, et cetera. So it's, it's lined up and investors, ordinary people would associate risk with not attaining those goals. So there is an important distinction between goal risk and volatility. So here's a simple example. So imagine you have a portfolio that is currently underfunded, which means you're, you have not reached your desired goal amount. And at this point, if you try to decrease the standard deviation or the volatility of the portfolio, it actually increases the likelihood of not attaining your goals. Okay, so there's really a distinction between attaining goals and between the, the volatility of the portfolio. So that leads to the whole introduction of this goal-based investing, which has gained popularity over the past few years. So here is a, so Robert Merton is a big advocate of goal-based investing. And here is a quote uh, from a panel discussion by him. So he says, goal-based investing will be very important in the next decade. For example, if you have a goal of funding retirement or a benefit plan, you set the goal and manage it through a process called liability-driven investing. If you follow a liability-driven goal, then regardless of whether your sharp ratio exceeds those of your competitors, you can outperform competitors who lose the focus on the goals. And moreover, we'll be driven to the idea of greater service by knowing the client better, understanding what the client really needs, getting the client to identify what the actual goal is, and then designing dynamic strategies that achieve that goal. So it's really a client-centered investment approach. Okay, so and then the goals can be classified into different tiers based on individuals' uh, degree of urgency. I'm sure, I'm, I'm sure most of you have seen one version of or another of this pyramids thing. Like it's, uh, psychologists have well studied this, like on the bottom of the pyramids, you have more fundamental needs like food, the lodgings, et cetera. You have essential needs, and then you have going up, you have insurance lifestyles or goals which are more on the aspirational aspects and then finally we have legacies here i don't have enough space but uh there's a so uh, a person called uh, jean uh, brunel who's a pioneer of this goal based investing called these uh, four different tiers tiers needs wants wishes and dreams okay so obviously for different tiers of goals investors have different like risk tolerance Okay, so for the basic necessities like the needs, they really want it to be achieved with high success rate. And for like the aspirational aspect or the dreams, it can be more flexible. So here are some like typical numbers um, taken from uh, Brunel's book um, of the typical like success probabilities associated with these four tiers of goals. And then here's the flip side of all these needs, wants, wishes, and dreams. So on the opposite side of needs is avoiding nightmares. So if you cannot satisfy your basic needs, then that's a nightmare. And then moving up, you have fears, worries, and concerns. All right, so I've already mentioned that goal-based investing is really a client-centered strategy. 
So it should focus around terms that are familiar to typical households with little or limited finance knowledge. And then like from past interactions with the industry, so especially my collaborator has talked a lot with the industry uh, people, it suggests that it's often easier for clients to specify a proper level of risk, of risk for the goal rather than specifying some type of utility from wealth or risk aversion. Okay, so it's very hard for them to understand what are the utilities and risk aversion, but it's easier for them to understand their goals, okay, and their desired success rate. Also, social psychology, there's also the psychological aspects. So social psychology shows that agents are intrinsically driven by goals in their daily life. Every one of us, we, are, we have goals. We write on like a long list of to-dos in the near future for long term. And actually, even if individual is not so clear about the goals, actually, if you make them to set goals for specific objectives, they actually result in a monthly saving increase by a substantial amount. So there, here is an experimental study, a recent one by Gargano and Rossi, based on some data uh, of a FinTech app. So actually setting goals resulting in a monthly saving increase by 90% of the average users. So there's lots of potential benefit for a goal-based uh, investing approach. All right, so given all these benefits, this principles of goal-based investment has become increasingly predominant in the wealth management industry, particularly in the uh, global advising industry, okay? or I mean, also in the, in the human advising industry, but here I'm focusing on robo advising. So these are online automated services that use algorithms to perform investment management rather than financial like advisors, like persons. And their main targeting our customers are like general you know, households. They try to provide affordable um, services, which are relatively cheap, okay, and also like with limit with very small capital requirement to, to uh, join these uh, services. And then the, uh, there are typically two approaches for robot advising, uh, either the modern portfolio theory approach, which is based on this mean variance portfolio optimization, and the other one is the goal-based approach. So, so robot advising has really gained a lot of popularity in the past few years, especially I think since 2015, lots of big banks, like big players, decided to enter into those industries. So nowadays you can find a lot of robot advising services uh, everywhere. So the two largest robo advising firms, Schwab and Betterment, they provide services using a goal-based strategy. So here I may also mention that for Betterment, for each goal type, Betterment actually also provides a maximum and a minimum recommended stock allocation. So this is like a suggested risk constraint recommended by the firm. I mean, this, you could also make it user specific, but like for people who doesn't understand risk uh, that well, the bank could also make recommendations. So this can also be kind of incorporated in our framework. So uh, here is uh, some examples of the type of goals one could have. So actually this is a, a survey, like ask people to put down their top three most important goals. And uh, here are the, some of the stuff that receives uh, a lot of votes. So you have retirement, planning a vacation, emergency, purchase a new home, etc. You have a uh, different goals. And this is uh, from uh, Franklin Templeton. Templeton. So yeah, let me mention some related literatures on dynamic goal-based investing. So the uh, closest like recent uh, works are a series of papers by Das and his uh, collaborators starting from 2018. So they kind of looked at both static and dynamic models of wealth management. Okay, but what they kind of did is did a mixture or a blend of this modern portfolio theory and the goal-based investing. So kind of from the mean variance portfolio optimization, they have this efficient frontier. So they're, all, they're picking finitely many portfolios on the efficient frontier, and that's all their actions. So it's a finite set of actions. And then for these set of actions, they try to, for example, in their earlier papers, they try to maximize the goal reaching probabilities just by choosing among these finite action set in a dynamic way. So our um, work can also be treated as part of a larger stream of literature called asset liability stochastic dynamic programming. 
And here is a incomplete list of some of the uh, papers, some of the papers in this aspects. So all these papers, they kind of deal with, oops. Not showing up. So maybe it went off screen. So point there and then slide it over. Yeah, yeah, it's in the top right corner. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> okay. Right. So in these works, um, there is a, a single goal deadline. But for us, like I guess uh, one of the key differences is we're trying to incorporate multiple goals with multiple different deadlines, which are more realistic than mimicking what's happening for real investors. So also another uh, very recent work is the one by uh, Civitanic, uh, Steve Coe and uh, their collaborators. So they look at a weighted average of probabilities of achieving target levels and at the same time also avoid specific loss levels. Um, but in their case, although they have this weighted average, but it's not weighted across multiple goals, they actually have a single deadline. So the weight is applied to different scenarios where their wealth lies in different range. Okay, so again, it's, it's a single deadline. Okay, so here, the first key question is how to handle actually multiple competing goals. I mean, it's competing because obviously the resource is limited for uh, ordinary people. So how do we pre prioritize between multiple flexible goals? Actually here, we're allowing flexible goals because I mean, one could potentially consider not fully funding a goal, but only considering partial fulfillment. Because sometimes the goals can be flexible. So you, cannot, you, you do not have the money to buy a half a million house, but maybe you can buy a 400,000 house, like just a cheaper one as a substitute. Or maybe you don't have enough money to send your kids to a private university and you can do a state university, like a public one, stuff like that. So partial fulfillment goals should be, uh, should be allowed somewhat. So here the question is, should an investor forego an immediate goal in order to increase the chances of attending future goals? So here in the, in the current framework, the really the key question is a trade-off between consuming for the current goal versus saving for futures. So that's the key trade-off when you have multiple competing goals happening at different times. So obviously the relative importance of goals would matter a lot. So let me also mention that um, many of the robo-advising firms that is adopting a goal-based uh, investing approach is trying to optimize, such as Betterman, they're trying to optimize different goals in separate portfolios. So it's like, okay, for purchasing a house, the investor has to build an account and just save for that goal. And for different retirement, build a different goals, I mean, different account. I mean, it probably makes sense if one account is like taxable, the other is non-taxable because you cannot really freely transfer money between a taxable ones and a non-taxable ones. But even within all these taxable accounts, all goals are treated in isolation, which, I mean, of course, cannot be optimal because uh, it prevents this offset between underfunded and overfunded goals. So by treating everything in a single portfolio, one can potentially gain some efficiencies by just optimizing things all at once. All right, so, so much for the introduction. Let me quickly move to the uh, problem formulation part. So for those uh, theoretically inclined people, the, there won't be a lot of mathematical technicalities. So it's mainly to illustrate the concepts and, and, and the model. So here's the uh, client input. So the client uh, provides the initial capital like at account opening. And there is also a continuous time, or we're modeling things in continuous time. So there is also a continuous time income stream denoted by I, which is a rate. So for example, this could be the fraction of client's paycheck added to her portfolio. And then the goals are described by a series of triplets, where GK is the amount of the, of the case goal, TK is the deadline of the case goal, and alpha k is the client's relative priority of the case goal. So here, we just assume they sum up to one. This is without loss of generality, it's just by a scaling or normalization. Let me point out that for simplicity of the presentation or just notational simplicity, we assume all deadlines are strict distinct. Okay. But 
in practice, you can imagine if you want to model concurrent goals, you can take one of the, the two, two uh, deadlines to be very close to each other. That should be like good enough approximation. Or even if mathematically you want to consider concurrent goals, there's not much difficulty. It just makes the whole presentation slightly more complicated. So, but for simplicity, we'll assume they're all distinct. So finally, um, the clients could also input a maximum portfolio volatility C as another risk constraint in addition to risks associated with the goals. Okay, but if the investor don't understand volatility that well, I mean, the robo advisors could also provide some suggestions or a few choices of this uh, upper bound um, for the investor to choose from. I mean, this one for the actual optimal strategies will not always be binding, so you can deviate away from this maximum portfolio volatility. All right, so in addition to the client's uh, input, we also have market parameters. So these are calibrated by the uh, wealth manager. The clients don't need to do this job. So let's assume we, we're just uh, considering investment in uncorrelated risky assets whose dynamics follows a multidimensional geometric brown emotion. And the information, just the one generated by all the brown emotions. And let's write mu for the mean return vector and the capital sigma be the volatility matrix. And we're just going to assume most of the simple setting, the market is arbitrage free. Specifically, we assume the sigma sigma transpose is an invertible matrix. I mean, this is the covariance matrix of the return. Okay, so once you assume that, you can actually write down a, a form for the market price of risk and the market will be arbitrage free. So, oh, so of course here, uh, you, you might want to assume that this uh, driving brown emotion M prime is bigger than M. I mean, for this to be invertible. I mean, and bigger or equal to M. All right, so the investment strategies consist of two components. One is the portfolio allocation. So pi, this is the fraction of wealth invested in each assets. And then given that, you can write down the dynamics of the client's wealth in between uh, consecutive, some consecutive goal deadlines. The first term is just the income. Second term is the interest uh, gain from the money market. And last term is the uh, changes due to the uh, risky asset investment. Okay, so this is just a single dimensional. So the problem isn't really very high dimensional. It's, it's pretty easy. And then at each goal deadline, the second control component is the theta k. So the investor will withdraw amount equal to gk times theta k. So this product is the consumption towards the kth goal. So here we call the theta k, which is 0, 1 valued and ftk measurable. We call this the funding ratio for the kth goal. So if theta k is equal to 1, we say the kth goal is fully funded. If theta k is less than 1, we say the kth goal is partially funded with a funding level equal to theta k. Mm -hmm. Quick clarification: yeah. Is GK around variable or a GK variable is a fixed? It's a fixed amount. It's a fixed, yeah. Okay. yeah, I mean, for most investors, they they just specify some amount. One could potentially consider some more flexible ones with a distribution, but yeah, here it's just a constant. Okay, so then we consider a portfolio constraints. So at each point in time, the portfolio pi has to lie in this convex set, which is determined by this maximum portfolio volatility. And also here we assume there is a prohibition of uh, no short selling and also no borrowing. So you could also, I mean, if Betterman is uh, restrict putting a maximum or minimum stock allocation, you could change this one to some other numbers. So that could be like user specified or could be recommended by the uh, robo advisors or wealth managers. So the set of admissible controls for the problem starting at time t with wealth x denoted by this ATX, consists of the pairs pi and theta, where pi is progressively measurable, delta C valued, theta is a random vector whose kth component is FTK measurable, zero one valued, and satisfy this inequality, it just means you cannot withdraw more than what you have at that point. Okay, so it's a budget constraint. And the objective is also pretty simple, it's just to maximize the expected weighted goal fundedness. Okay, which one can show is actually equivalent to minimizing the 
weighted expected shortfall of the fundness. So here we're looking at the shortfall of the funding ratio, not actually of the wealth, because obviously a same amount of money means very different things towards different goals. Let's say you buy a house that is $1,000 cheaper, it's very different from financing a vacation, which is $1,000 cheaper. So like the same amount matters very differently for different goals. So that's why here we actually look at the funding ratio, not the actual amount. So for those of you who are very familiar with stochastic control theory, this is just a pretty standard stochastic control problems with some portfolio with uh, control constraints, as well as state constraints. So we can solve it using dynamic programming approach. To that, we introduce the value function Vtx, which is a supremum of all the, the expectation of the weighted future funding ratios, condition on that at time t, our wealth is equal to little x. So by some simple analysis argument, one can show that this is a concave function in X, which immediately gives some regularity of this value function. So for example, all the left and right derivatives will exist everywhere. And for such a problem, let me also point out that there actually exists a so-called safe level, which is a wealth level above which all remaining goals can be fully funded with probability one. So beyond that, you don't need to invest in risky asset if your goal is just to satisfy your future goals. You can just invest everything in the risk-free asset, and that is fine. So this, the existence of such a safe level also you know, makes the numerical domain like bounded if you try to do numerical computation, which is nice. So this value function and the safe level can be computed backward in time okay, by dynamic programming. And in particular, actually, this ST has a closed form solution. You can write it down. All right, so let me describe the backward procedures in a little bit more details. So starting from the final goal deadline, you solve a very simple static optimization problems. You get the uh, funding, optimal funding ratio, which is just the minimum of, of your current wealth. So this, this uh, wedge is the minimum of two numbers. And the mth goal amount, which is the last goal amount, divided by g of m. So you just spend all your money or until the goal is fully funded. And then at intermediate goal deadlines, you solve a static optimization problem, consists of a trade-off between, you know, this is how much you get from uh, consuming towards the current goal, and also the value derived from future goals. Okay, so you choose theta k to maximize this. Yeah, so this is going to be a feedback function. One can show this is continuous. So it's, it's going to be well-defined, measurable. Later on, if you plug in your state process x into here, so this is chosen to optimally to, to find the optimal trade-off between consumption and savings. And then in between goal deadlines, one can solve the value function by solving a associated hamilton jacobi bellman equation, which is a second order nonlinear PDE. Okay, so here there are some technical details, but apart from the technicalities, one can show the following proposition holds. So one can try to characterize this uh, value function as the unique viscosity solution to a nonlinear Cauchy problem. So here, let me mention, in case you, don't, uh, you, you have not heard about viscosity solution, this is just a weaker notion of solution, which doesn't require the value function to be differentiable or, or possess like second order derivative, et cetera. It's a weaker notion of solution. So the reason here is that we are not really aware of a theorem that um, actually provides us a classical solution in this particular setup where we have not necessarily smooth utility functions here. So if you treat this terminal condition as a utility function because V is concave, the general theories have like this uh, smooth initial condition, smooth utility functions satisfy some emitter conditions. And also here we have a uh, state and portfolio constraints and the market also is incomplete. So we actually have, don't, didn't find a theory which gives us a classical solution here. So, but for numerical computation purposes, it's often good enough to just have a viscosity characterization because of nice stability property of viscosity solutions. So anyway, so we just take this proposition. So of course, one has to check certain conditions to make sure this, um, this proposition falls into some more general theorems uh, in this uh, nice paper by Bouchard and Nutz, which considered a weak dynamic programming with generalized state constraints. 
So it's a pretty nice paper that covers a lot of the situations where the classical solution doesn't, uh, is not available. Okay, so anyway, so that's the uh, technical part about the value functions. Then for the optimal funding ratio, which is the uh, key object of this work is uh, the following. So one can show that any optimizer can be characterized by the generalized version of the KKT conditions, which consists of a bunch of uh, primal dual feasibility as well as, as complementary slackness. Okay. And then one can show that the largest optimizer is given in feedback form by this quantity here, which consists of three parts. Okay, so here are uh, two minimum. So in words, what this expression is saying that it is optimal. So at the current wealth level X, you start from zero and, and for every additional dollars, you try to determine how you want to spend it. So it is optimal to increase your spending or right, the funding ratio from zero until either one of these three conditions are satisfied. So either go K is fully funded, which is this term here, or budget constraint is tight, which is this term here, or we're looking at this infimum here, which means the marginal benefit alpha k over gk of funding the current goal is smaller than the marginal benefit of saving for future goal liabilities, which is this partial derivative here. So one can think of this ratio alpha k over gk as some sort of cost adjusted importance. Okay, so alpha k is the importance, the priority, but then you adjust it by the cost of that goal. Okay. So this theta star k can be written in actually in a more explicit form, at least in the current framework, as a piecewise linear function, okay, where this threshold bk is where these two terms roughly equal to each other. I mean, if you assume v is differentiable, this is where the marginal utilities are, like, marginal benefit is roughly equal to the marginal cost here. So that's like an important threshold. So below this threshold, you don't consume, you're just gonna save for future goals. Above that, you consume however much you need. Okay? And you only consume the difference. So you just try to reach BK and stop there. So from zero to BK, that's how much you're gonna save for future. So here this BK, we call it the consumption threshold for the case goal. Okay. So BK actually determines this trade-off of funding versus saving for futures. So it's pretty clear that this has to be less than or equal to the safe level, which is a finite. And then using some stochastic analysis, one can actually also show the following. So if this uh, cost adjusted importance of the current goal is less than or equal to some, the same thing of some future goals, and if this uh, future income stream is sufficiently small, then this BK will be non-trivial will be strictly positive. So you always save a little bit towards future, at least. So this is saying that save if some upcoming goals have a higher priority, which means high alpha or low amounts, which means small g, and future income streams are small. All right. So I think uh, timing is pretty good. So I'll, finally, I'll present uh, some numerical examples and also discuss some of the comparative statics. So the market parameters here we're taking is a uh, risk-free rate is 0.05%. I apologize, I acknowledge it doesn't match with the reality nowadays because the project actually started before the pandemic. It got delayed multiple times. So at that point, we're still in a very low interest rate environment. That's a little bit outdated. And we're gonna work with a too risky asset just for illustration purpose. And so we're gonna use some uh, historical data returns from 20 year period to 1998 and 2017, based on some index funds like Vanguard index funds representing US bonds and US stocks. So the first asset is less risky, it's based on bonds, it's less risky. So we have a smaller return, smaller volatility and uh, Second asset is more risky, it's a higher return and, and higher risk. So that's based on US stocks. Okay, and let us also consider a uh, client, which maybe we can call it a generation Z. 
So uh, <laughs> with three investment goals. Okay, so imagine he wants to purchase a car in six months that is worth $30,000. And in two years, want to finance a vacation of $10,000. And then in five years, he wants to save for a down payment, which is $250,000. Okay, so three competing goals. And the income stream is $1,000 per month. And the initial capital, let's say it's $10,000. And for illustration purposes, let's say we are considering equal weighted goals. And here, let's also take a risk tolerance or the maximum portfolio volatility to be 7.5%. Uh, okay, so here is uh, the optimal allocation strategy. So in your market, solve the problems. And uh, here, what I'm plotting, oops, okay. What I'm plotting is the pi one as a feedback function of T and X. So along the time axis, along the uh, wealth axis, and wealth is measured in thousands of dollars. And this is the allocation in the second or more risky asset. Here is the portfolio volatility. Last one is the value function. So here, like this flat surface is actually corresponding to the volatility constraint to be binding. Okay. But you also see places where this constraint is not actually binding. I mean, you can actually also remove that constraint if you wish. So this is an optional constraint. But here, what you see, so let me make two observations, is that as you move towards the safe level, your risk aversion actually changes. So you see a increase of the allocation in asset one, a decrease in the allocation in asset two. So you have a shift towards, more, uh, towards less risky assets, and your total portfolio volatility drops as you move towards the safe level. And secondly, here, these uh, peaks in the middle, that corresponds to the goals. So when you have upcoming goals, you see in the venicity of the goal amounts, your risk aversion like sort of increases. You also shift your allocation from the more risky assets to the less risky asset, and your total portfolio volatility drops. <coughs> okay, and the volatility constraint is not binding. So here, this is where this goal risk kicks in. Questions? So that's the baseline benchmark where we have equal weight. So what happens if we try to shift the goal priorities a little bit? So here, let's consider a slight variation where we make alpha one a lot larger than alpha two. Okay. So increase the priority of goal one relative to goal two and then maintain the, the importance of the third goal. So then we get, so here I'm plotting a slices of the allocations prior, just immediately prior to the first goal deadline, okay, at P1 minus. So here it's a little bit harder to see. So the dashed, so, so the dotted red line are the weight change case and the blue, solid blue curve is the benchmark case, but here it's a little bit harder to see. So let me just explain. So here you actually see the, uh, there, the peak drops here for the um, allocation in the second asset, and the peak here becomes higher for allocation in the first asset, and the total portfolio volatility actually also drops here. The peak becomes, the value becomes like deeper. So again, you see as you increase the priority of goal one relative to goal two, you see a increase in the risk aversion and the portfolio become less risky. Because I mean, goal one is more important and goal one is upcoming, it, it's due soon. So this is for prior to the deadline of goal one. Let's also look at same weight change, but just immediately prior to the deadline of the second goal. Now you see the opposite behavior because now goal two is less important than before in relative sense. So here you see the red dotted red lines is much higher here in the valley than the previous blue lines. And here you see uh, the red ones, but the peak also becomes smaller. And here you see the valley becomes like less deep. So here investors are actually taking more risk before the deadline of the second goal. 
Okay, so you see an increase in, in the risk-taking behaviors. Okay, because now go to becomes less less priority, uh, less priority, less important. So like this goal characteristics really can shift investors' uh, risk appetite. Okay, not just the portfolio volatility, but like actually the goal characteristics. So it is also kind of important for a robo advisor to provide the household how they are doing in terms of each of their goals. So these quantities, I mean, in practice, these should be reported every now and then for the investors to see. And even initially, I mean, when the investors try to decide how much income he tries to, he wants to contribute, and what are the, how do we set the alphas, for example, it might be beneficial to have an interactive like platforms to play with around different parameters and see, okay, if I set it to be this, this is gonna be like my expectations for what's happening in future. So it's like providing a, a menus for the investors to see. So in this example, so we choose different X zeros and different I's, and then we report the so mean and standard deviations of all three goals uh, based on 5,000 sample paths. Okay. So here, actually from the first line, you already see that initially, despite the contribution, you are not consuming towards the first goal at all. You're actually saving for the second and the third one here. As you gradually increase your contribution, both initially and the income stream, then you are gradually allocating some wealth to the first goal. Okay, but also kind of if you compare, let's say this 2,500 versus this uh, 10,500, you see for the third goal, these numbers are the same. So that, that just means this increase in your initial deposit does not go to the third goal. You're actually allocating to the second and the first goal first. So there is some internal ordering of how important these go to you at the specific point. So in this example, because the second goal, which is a vacation, is much easier to satisfy. It's only $10,000. You kind of internally try to prioritize this one first and then the first one and then the down payment one, which is very hard to satisfy when you have like uh, not a lot of wealth. All right, and so in the previous theoretical analysis, we kind of know that this uh, consumption threshold BK is important in determining the trade-off between consuming for the current towards the current goal and saving for the future. So here, what we did is actually plot these the BKs for the first goal okay, as a function of the income rate I, which we're going to call it a consumption boundary when you vary all the other uh, goal characteristics. So here, what I'm doing is I'm increasing the amount of the second goal and look at the impact it has on the consumption boundary of the first goal. So you see that as the second goal becomes more difficult to satisfy, it shifts upward. So you have to save more because the second goal actually now demands more. And similarly, if you try to make the second goal more important by increasing alpha, you also see an upward shift of the consumption boundary. And similarly, if you try to make the second goal more urgent by decreasing its deadline, you also see an upward shift here. So this is pretty consistent with the intuition. But at the same time, if you look at the third goal, I'm doing the same thing. I'm increasing the goal amount or increasing alpha, but you actually see the opposite behavior here. So increasing G3 from 50 to 200, you actually see a drop, okay, downward shift of the consumption boundary. I mean, the reason here is really that goal three is already pretty hard to satisfy. When it's at like 50, you still have some possibilities of, of attaining a pretty decent portion of it. So investors are gonna save a little bit, but you make it even more difficult. It just becomes less prioritized than the first goal. So investor is just saying to herself, okay, I'm not going to, I'm going to ignore the third goal. At this present moment, let me just try to get my first goal and second goal funded. I don't worry about the third goal at all. I'm like giving up on it, at least initially. So actually you see a downward shift of the consumption boundary. And similarly, like for this alpha stuff. And here for the, for the T, actually we don't see a lot of difference, at least in this range. I'm sure if you vary it even more wildly, you might see some difference. Okay. But here it just, it's not very sensitive to changes in the third goal because it's already difficult enough to satisfy. 
it has a lower priority compared to the first goal at this point. So it doesn't really affect B1. So that's the message here. All right, so I guess because of the time, let me uh, skip some comments on the numerical PD algorithm. There is some uh, technicality here. Are you, if you're interested, we can talk offline. So let me also mention that in the presentation, we kind of work with minimizing the expected shortfall of the fundness of the funding ratio. But one can actually look at a more general version of the optimization criteria by putting an arbitrary continuous function fk of theta k. Because sometimes maybe an investor for a particular goal, he's not willing to accept a partial funding ratio bef I mean, below a certain threshold. For example, for the, the kids' college education, maybe the tuition is this amount. It doesn't, he's not willing to actually accept a, a, a much lower amount. So you could also have a general version of this fk here. So in the previous examples, this fk just the identity function. So in general, fk could be a function that takes 0, 1 to 0, 1, which is continuous for all k. So just having continuity, you could still have all these viscosity characterization, and you can, you can do a numerical computation. However, the nice uh, structure of the optimal funding ratio may not be valid. So if in addition, these FKs are actually differentiable concave and increasing, then you can further additionally get concavities and this characterization. And you can also show the existence of a threshold BK similar to before, below which you don't consume at all. And some similar properties as before. But in the general case, we cannot say much, except that you can have the viscosity characterization, you run the numerics and see what happens. Okay. But at least this offers a way of incorporating things which are not concave, for example. All right, so let me quickly uh, wrap up. So what we did here is we introduced a framework, pretty uh, simple framework for dynamic goal-based wealth management that should be easy to implement and understand and communicate with the general households. So uh, we see that the consumption and goal foundedness depends on all of the goal characteristics, the priorities, the amounts, and the deadlines. And a uh, key highlight, at least for this uh, competing multiple goals, is the trade-off between allocating towards current goals versus saving for future goals. In particular, we'll look at the comparative statics of the consumption boundary and how it, depend how it depends on the goal characteristics. And recall the picture about the weight change and how does the allocation uh, changes. We see that we observe that wealth manager is more risk averse for higher priority goals and less risk averse for lower priority goals. So finally, uh, let me mention maybe some uh, broader set of applications. So we, we got some uh, very uh, nice uh, comments, feedbacks from Das, so one of the people working on goal-based investing as well. So kind of mentioned to us, uh, this potentially could be applied to pension funds and social securities. So for pension funds, you can think about um, each cohort have its, uh, can have its own fundness, rather than you know, reporting the, entire fund, the fundness of the entire pension plan. We should report, oops. So we should try to report the fundness of each cohort. So that corresponds to each of the status. So for each cohort, you can have you can think about them have a goal amount and a different deadline. A different deadline. Same for social security. One can consider fundness of each generation, such as baby boomers, generation Z, millennials. So by choosing the alpha value, the relative benefit to each generation can be adjusted. And this would make it more transparent, actually, which generations are going to lose out in this social security race. Instead of just, you know, packeting everything into a single thing, like all mixed together, somebody would be losing. Okay? And it's, it would be nice to know who. All right, so that's all I want to talk about today. And um, here are some references.